Okay, uh, yeah, my name is Jacob Williams. I work at the NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, give me a second, I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about Copernicus. It's a spacecraft trajectory design and optimization program that we develop at JSC. Um, first of all, what is Copernicus? Um, it's, a, it's a generalized a spacecraft trajectory design and optimization application. Um, by by this I mean it's it's a program that designs the the path that a spacecraft would travel in space. It's not a it's not a it doesn't we don't des it's not for designing spacecraft. It's not for navigation. It's not for operations. It's for designing the uh, trajectories. So the orbits of the spacecraft. Uh, this could be um, an orbit around the Earth. It could be a transfer from one orbit to another around the Earth. It could be a transfer from the Earth to the Moon. It could be flybys of the planets. It could be really any anything, any uh, trajectory that, are, that happens in space. We can model multiple spacecraft, multiple propulsion systems, different engines. Uh, it has an integrated GUI. This is something that may be atypical for Fortran in, in that it's actually an interactive program. It has uh, a GUI, it has 3D graphics, um, it's got a, a flexible architecture that we'll talk about and, and uh, selectable mission fidelity. So you can do uh, simple things. You can do super complex things. Um, low thrust, high thrust, multi-body, interplanetary, all kinds of transfers. Um, we develop it at JSC. Currently, it's, it's, not, a, it's not publicly available. Currently, we, uh, currently, there's a limitation that you have to be a NASA employee or a U.S. government contractor. We're trying to open that up a little bit. So just, just stay tuned on that. Uh, it's a expandable architecture. We'll talk a little bit about that. And, and I did mention it was a, a desktop application, but you can also use it without the, without the GUI. So we, we use it on a, a computing cluster where we can, you know, spawn off thousands of copies of Copernicus to do what we need to do. Um, a, a complicated trajectory, uh, spacecraft trajectory um, it, entails a lot of different things, a lot of different models. So there's a lot of different models in Copernicus. The overall idea is we have this segment architecture where we, there's a, the cartoon here at the bottom is just kind of a little example where you might have some mission that say starts at the earth. Uh, there's an ascent from the earth. There's a coast period. There's maybe a, a, an in-space or a, 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 a earth departure maneuver, another coast. Maybe there's a low thrust deep space maneuver. Maybe there's a flyby of another body, um, and then maybe there's a, a, a high thrust uh, landing on a, on a different body or an asteroid or moon or something. And maybe these are three different engines. Maybe these are different vehicles. Maybe part of the trajectory branches off, stage disposal in this case. So it's, it's really, um, Copernicus really lets you design the mission however you want to. It's not a, it's not a push button thing where you just say, I, I want to just go to Mars and boom, you push the Mars button. You have to actually lay out the mission, but once you, but you can lay it out the way you want and then you can select the models you want. You see a little bit of the GUI here where you can uh, input the parameters that you want. So for, for these trajectories, they're generally uh, highly nonlinear constrained optimization problems. And so they'll have components of, um, you know, we'll, we'll have numerical integration, we'll have numerical differentiation. We have, we obviously an ephemeris of the, the planets different reference frames, different engine models, spacecraft models, interpolation, 3D visualization, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's kind of a very basic overview. The history of Copernicus is uh, since the first line of code was written, it's been almost 20 years since uh, it began in, at the University of Texas at Austin in 2001. Uh, we, it, it, uh, JSC and UT collaborated for a while and then the, the first uh, production release was in 2006. We've had five major releases, a bunch of minor releases. 5.0 just came out last week. It is really the most significant release we've ever done. It's a, it's a major change to the whole architecture. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, primary development is at JSC. Uh, there's a little screenshot here. The, the very early prototypes were a text-based program where it was a text-based input where you go in, you went in and edited a text file, like, like really a lot of Fortran programs probably are now. You, you're editing a text file and then you just run the program and it gives you the output. We've transitioned away from that to be more of a interactive GUI type application. Uh, Copernicus usage uh, for the, the last major release, the 4.x series that we released in uh, 2014, 
JSC has issued a, a hundred, about 190 licenses. So a license could be a person at another NASA center, or it could be an organization like a, a major contractor. So one, one license could be one person or it could be really multiple people. Since the first release, we've issued 300, about 300 licenses. So it's a pretty broad user base. It's used at really all the NASA centers, different contractors, some universities that have NASA contracts. It's really become the workhorse uh, trajectory design tool for uh, at JSC for the human spaceflight program. And by the way, all the, the eye candy here, these are all screenshots from Copernicus. So you, you see the, just, just some ideas of some trajectories. You actually see the trajectory while you're using the, the program. Uh, just a few slides here about what we're using it for. The first uh, mission that uh, actually flew in space that used Copernicus was LCROSS. And this was a mission that uh, it was the LRO LCROSS mission where uh, there was a, a, a lunar satellite. And then the, the idea was that the upper stage would have a controlled collision with the lunar surface that would then be monitored by this LCROSS satellite to, um, to, to you know, uh, look at the, the chemicals in the plume. Um, and basically, uh, here's a diagram of one of those trajectories where you, the, the center is the Earth, um, you, you do a transfer to the moon where the, the, the orbiter comes off, but then the actual upper stage goes into this highly inclined orbit and it does a couple res and then it comes back and then it collides with the moon here. So it's a pretty complicated trajectory. And this, this, this was a successful mission in 2009. Um, we can do asteroid, Mars, outer planets, whatever you want. We have a lot of different users doing a lot of different things with it. We have a couple examples here of a example, uh, 32 asteroid uh, flyby sequence. We have a Mars sample return mission. We have um, uh, a prototype uh, mission here of a, a sequence of maneuvers to go into to, to a Martian orbit. We have an example here of doing a, a outer planet flybys where you have Earth, Venus, Venus, Jupiter, Pluto mission. Um, at, at Johnson Space Center, we're the human space flight center for NASA. So we, we do uh, a lot of what we're doing now is with respect to the Orion spacecraft. And so, and the, and the Artemis missions, which is the, the missions to basically return humans to the lunar surface. So we do a lot of lunar missions. There's from anything from a simple Earth Moon free return, kind of a Apollo 8 kind of mission to what we're working on now, which is the Artemis 1 mission, which will be the first mission in the Artemis series. That is actually a, a fairly complicated mission to send an, an uncrewed uh, Orion to a high lunar orbit uh, to, to do the, uh, to, for a test, a test mission of Orion in the SLS launch vehicle. We can also do landing, lunar landing, um, and then we have uh, more exotic type orbits, halo orbits, distant retrograde orbits, near rectilinear halo orbits. We can do all this stuff. Um, the NASA's Deep Space Gateway program, um, the, the destination orbit is a, a type of halo orbit called a near rectilinear halo, halo orbit that we've designed in Copernicus, this uh, resonant uh, NRHO. And then we do all sorts of transfers to this orbit, from this orbit to other orbits. This is a kind of a cool transfer from an NRHO to a high lunar orbit. And this is a really complicated trajectory with a lot of low thrust, um, long duration, low thrust spirals. Um, uh, the Artemis missions, one, two, three, and then the HLS, um, the HLS missions coming up, human landing system. Um, as far as software development, um, Copernicus, it, we started in 2001 and it was a Fortran 7790 kind of program written in compact visual Fortran. It was Windows only and we transitioned to Intel in 2007. Um, it's it's cross-platform Windows, Mac, Linux. We have a policy of really continuously maintaining this and to keep up with the latest standards. And if basically, if Intel supports a feature, we're, we'll use it. We're not, we're not gonna wait. If, if it's a feature that we need, we're gonna use it. And um, Copernicus is never finished. It's designed to really be continuously updated and adding new models and new different ways to solve the problems. And we use a lot of different technologies here. Uh, it's not just Fortran, we're using Python now and C++ and all kinds of different other things. The architecture, um, very high level here, you know, originally from the very early version to the last, the release before the last release, uh, the, the entire program was Fortran, even the GUI. We use this Winteractor library. 
which some of you may be familiar with. Um, we kind of outgrew that because the program got so complicated that we transitioned to a Python uh, based GUI. Um, we've significantly refactored the program as, as 2003 plus 2008, 2018 or 2018 became, became available. We're using a lot of the modern uh, constructs, classes, polymorphism, just all of that we're, we're using in Copernicus. Uh, it's mostly standard with some Intel extensions. Um, 327 modules at last count, 218,000 lines of code, not counting some of the third party Fortran 77 stuff. It's implemented as a shared library. The, the Fortran core is a shared library that's now called from the Python GUI. Um, and so the, the Fortran is decoupled from the Python, which is not how it was when we used the WinterActor. In the WinterActor, it was all one thing, but now it's two really separate things. We're using the C interoperability, which is we're heavily using that for uh, callbacks from Python to Fortran. You, you, you click a button in the Python GUI, that's going to call a Fortran API in the shared library. It's going to do some calculations. It's going to possibly call back into the Python to send it some data or, or generate or update the graphics or uh, fill in the different fields or whatever you're doing. The uh, 3D graphics are uh, use OpenGL and the Open Scene Graph library is an open source C++ code that we're interfacing with through a Fortran interface. Another maybe slightly unique thing about Copernicus, or it's not a run of the mill thing for Fortran programs, is it's, uh, we want the, the, it's an interactive program and the user needs to be able to add models at runtime. And so there's a couple different ways we do that. One of them is a very simple um, custom uh, function parser that we wrote, um, just so you can enter certain e uh, equations, simple equations, and that, that's just uh, dynamically uh, evaluated. And then for, more advanced users, um, we, you can compile DLLs and load those. Um, that's, there's kind of a high bar for that. A lot of people don't want to write DLLs or don't know how to write DLLs or don't know what a DLL is. So eventually I think what I'm going to do is add another mode where you can call back into Python. So then they could provide a, a Python uh, interface, or a, a Python routine, or whatever that we can just evaluate. This is a picture of the GUI. I'm running out of time here, aren't I? This is a picture of the GUI. You see the interactive 3D graphics. You see the widgets. You can configure this GUI however you want. You can um, change the theme. The, the graphics are interactive and you see them update as the tool runs. You can zoom and pan and rotate. There's an embedded Python console that you can call certain things in the, in the API. We have a lot of different third-party components. Uh, SNOPT is a commercial tool. It's an optimizer. That's really one of the core components of Copernicus. It's Fortran 77. They're, they're working on a modern version. Um, SpiceLib is another major thing. Uh, it's currently Fortran, but unfortunately they announced they're gonna rewrite it in C++. So I'm not exactly sure what we're gonna do at that point, but we have a lot of different libraries. JSON Fortran is my, one of my libraries. Um, we're using that a lot for configuration files and data exchange and uh, data output and some others uh, written by other people and some of my colleagues. Conclusions, um, Copernicus is an example of an actively developed modern Fortran program uh, at NASA that has a wide user base. It's a critical tool at JSC and NASA. It's really the tool that's going to get us back to the moon as far as the trajectories are, are concerned. Um, and then when we, when we expanded it with the, the 5.0 release, we really, uh, adding the Python GUI and some, some other Python stuff really, I think, expanded the use case. Uh, we all have our Fortran wish lists. Um, we've talked about some of these in previous uh, slides, but from, from my point of view, to make my life easier to, for the things we're doing with Copernicus, I think, uh, obviously, the better ecosystem. We've talked about that. Generic programming, uh, differentiable programming, that would be a major thing. Exception handling. I think a string class, I think we need that. There's so much string manipulation in, in Copernicus and then a, a dynamic interactive capability, which we, we talked about a little bit. I think that's it. Uh, some references if you're interested. Uh, there's some code snippets in our 2018 paper. There's a little more about Copernicus 5 in the 2019 paper. Um, that's it. Thank you, Jacob, very, mu very much for this interesting talk. We have actually a couple of questions so the first is could a radiation component be used in your code so i think it's more on the physical side so is there just gravity or more um we have um we have solar radiation pressure um, we, you know obviously gravity is the major uh, component of us you know how a spacecraft moves is, is gravity we have solar radiation pressure gravity we have drag 
Um, so yeah. We yeah, have thanks. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, do you use automatic differentiation for optimal control gradients? And if so, which tool do you use? We do not use, we do not currently use automatic differentiation. We're actually, uh, that's a project we're looking into as we speak. Um, origin, the, from the beginning, Copernicus was designed to, to, to do uh, numerical gradients, which was, is kind of an easy thing to do. And it, it also makes it easier for when a user is able to plug in arbitrary code to Copernicus, that could be written in any language. So we're just, we're just using numerical differentiation. But we're, we're definitely looking into the, the auto, auto diff stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, next question. Are you using the AVX 512 flag? If so, what is its impact? So um, I don't know what that is. So odds are I'm not using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's vectorization flag. Okay. I, I don't see any more questions at the moment. So, um, I suggest we, we, we proceed with the next topic. Thank you very much again. You're welcome, sir.